Hi, fast. A very good morning to all of you, <laughs> brave people who arrived after the pub Greek night. And there are still some people arriving, so hurry, please. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to see you all here and a great pleasure to see especially the first speaker in the morning, <laughs> Sanjay Rangulam from Queen Mary University of London. And he will talk about permutation variant matrix systems and partition algebra. Please, you know. The floor and internet is yours. Thank you, Andre, very much. And thank you, the organizers. As usual, uh, this is a wonderful uh, meeting with a very interesting convergence of topics uh, in mathematical physics. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to speak here. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, permutation invariant matrix systems and partition algebras. Uh, so matrix systems come up a lot in uh, holography or gauge string duality more generally. Uh, and there is kind of in various applications of matrix systems in AVS CFT or holography, uh, there is a set of techniques that has been developed, a sort of algebraic uh, representation theory methods to deal with the combinatorics of matrix systems. Uh, and uh, usually one deals with systems that have unitary symmetry so physical systems with matrix variables x with un symmetry are ubiquitous in gauge string duality the ikkt model uh the bfss matrix model or we can have n equals four super young mills theory. all these models have un uh, at least there are versions of them with un gauge symmetry uh and in for example n equals four super young mills in four dimensions the theory with un gauge symmetry is the CFT4 and there's a dual AVS5 cross S5. Uh, so uh, one of the lessons uh, over the last several years, maybe 20 years, is that representation theory methods are very useful in understanding AVS5 CFT, CFT4, in particular, understanding large composite CFT operators in, in the CFT. So you just have some elementary fields and you want to take polynomial invar polynomial functions of that. And because of UN, you have UN invariant polynomial functions or of interest. And uh, these, uh, when these degrees of these polynomials become large, these uh, invariant functions uh, and the corresponding operators in CFT are related to interesting things like giant gravitons, which are a kind of brain in ADS, LLM geometry, which is a kind of uh, solution to Einstein supergravity equations in ADS5 cross S5, a class of solutions with uh, asymptotics of ADS5 cross S5. So uh, one of the things that has been understood is that uh, to understand the map between these various things that, is happen that are happening in, in the space time and what is happening in the CFT, you have to think about composite operators, all of them, and classify them, think about their correlators and so on. Uh, and that can be related to stuff happening in space time. So one of the examples of uh, like a large operator is a determinant of x where x is a matrix complex matrix which is one of the fields in this un gauge theory and more general composite operators generalizing the determinant are labeled by young diagrams so so the kind of mathematical questions that come up we have a matrix of size n and we want to classify polynomial functions of x so think of xig as variables matrix variables and you want to look at polynomials of degree k and you want polynomials which are invariant and the a an adjoint action of un and uh, this is a familiar thing uh, the invariant functions are traces of x or products of traces which are called multi-traces and there's a young diagram labeled operators which are linear combinations of multi-traces so this multi-trace basis and the young diagram basis so this is one kind of basis this is another kind of basis uh the the map between them uses representation theory uh and uh, these representation theory methods for understanding these invariants turns out can be generalized when you replace this invariant theory problem uh x goes to ux u dagger for uh u being a general matrix in un now we just think about the n-dimensional vector space. So UN, you can think of them as matrices acting on an n-dimensional vector space. On that n-dimensional vector space, you could also have SN acting, the symmetric group of uh, 
acting on n-dimensional vector space. This is called the natural representation. So for every permutation, you have a matrix, which is the matrix in the natural representation. And you require functions invariant under this kind of transformation. In indices, it's very explicit. Xij goes to uh, x sigma of i sigma of j, where sigma is a permutation of these n things. i and j take values from 1 to n. So you want to look at functions of x, which are invariant, polynomial functions, invariant under this transformation. So this is a very natural generalization of something we do a lot in ads -CFT, and uh, we have been investigating in a set of papers recently, uh, sort of uh, what happens to this kinds of invariant theory problem when you look at uh, matrix models. So uh, we could look at Gaussian matrix models, which are permutation invariant. They are much more general than the usual Gaussian matrix models. Uh, and you can look at uh, multi-matrix models. And then in these last two papers, there's these three papers with my two students, uh, and uh, these last two papers, we are starting to look at aspects of kind of matrix uh, uh, invariants, which are sort of suggestive of holography. Uh, so there, there's something called large n factorization, which is important for gauge string duality. And we are finding, we are finding uh, analogous large n factorization properties for these new kind of invariant theory problems. And also we're looking at large n now matrix quantum mechanics, not just matrix models and looking at some interesting physics that comes out of that. And uh, a very important tool will be partition algebras, and I'll explain why these come up. So the trace basis uh, that I just talked about for UN invariants, there's a convenient way to think about it in terms of permutations. So let's say you have degree K. So there are two kinds of permutations that will ha happen in this talk. UN, where I goes from one to N, and another, so UN will be replaced by SN, for now it is just UN, but also when you have degree K invariants, there are, there's an SK. So, uh, so for the moment, there is UN acting on these indices separate individually, and then on this collection of indices, permuting them is SK. So you can use uh, these permutations of indices to build gauge invariants, and these uh, SK permutations related to the degree of the operator, they act on this set of indices, which are uh, k-fold tensor product of Vn, the fundamental representation of Un here, uh, by just swapping the different factors. So this kind of way of writing gauge invariants, uh, you can write it conveniently by thinking about this permutation as a linear operator in this n-fold k-fold tensor space. And what this is doing, you just kind of stare at it a little bit, is actually something quite neat, which you can write an index freeway. So tau is just a linear operator. You're composing it with x tensor k, and then you're taking a trace in that space. So, so that's a kind of just, you brought everything down to sort of linear operators in tensor space, uh, which is a very nice way to think about things. Because these are bosonic variables, so you can swap them around for any fixed tau, you can swap them around uh, and you get the same operator. That means that if you take an operator labeled by tau, the sigma should be tau here, uh, and you conjugate that by a gamma, any permutation in SK, you get the same operator. So essentially this amounts to studying, studying the combinatorics of uh, gauge invariant functions of one matrix amounts to studying conjugacy classes, which are defined using this equivalence. Uh, it is also useful to think about the group algebra where you take about linear combinations of this SK with arbitrary complex coefficients. And for any such uh, group algebra element, you can correspondingly form this linear combination of operators. So for each sigma, I have an operator of this kind. And when I have group algebra elements, I can form analogous linear combinations. Great, so here's some, some simple examples. Uh, when you have k equals three, sorry, this should be k, then there are three conjugacy classes and there are three trace structures, single trace to the power cubed and, and these different things. So there's a connection, there's a precise correspondence when n is large between conjugacy classes and gauge invariants. So when we have uh, two point functions uh, of um, one of the things that we look at, you have a simple matrix model uh, and you can look at uh, these correlation functions of two of these uh, permutation labeled uh, gauge invariant functions. 
Turns out the answer is very nice in terms of group algebra things. Basically, you take this permutation, that permutation, sum over gamma and sigma, and this is a delta function on the group, uh, which is uh, defined to be one if this group element uh, is one and zero otherwise. C sigma three is the number of cycles in the permutation. So it's kind of just pure group algebras that controls the combinatorics of weak contractions. Gamma is the sum of weak contractions. An important property follows from this formula. If you define a normalized version of that, where you take this guy and you divide by the square root of its norm as defined by these two point functions, uh, and you take two of these observables uh, to leading order in one over n, the observable is only non-zero if these two conjugacy classes are equal. So it's like a diagonal inner product in the conjugacy classes at leading order. And this is important for ADS-CFT, it's called large n factorization. So this kind of trace-like basis for SN invariance of X can be generalized uh, for UN invariance can be generalized to SN. Again, we have a bunch of X's with upper and lower indices, some up, which is an operator in tensor space, and you have to contract it with something else. And that something else is simply an a general element of partition algebra. So, so I'll tell you more about partition algebras. So when you replace the manifest symmetry of your problem, instead of being in, interested in gauge invariance on the UN, you're interested in gauge invariance on the SN. When you replace this manifest symmetry by SN, this SK, which are related to the degrees of the different observables, these are replaced by a tower of partition algebras. And this gamma equivalence I had before still holds. So you're going, you're going to look at uh, this SK. So SK turns out will be, or the group algebra of SK will be a subalgebra of this guy. And you can define this kind of equivalence and more precisely, we are interested in group in partition algebra elements subject to this equivalent. So basically, how you think about UN invariance in this way generalizes nicely. So aside from this trace basis, it is important ADS-CFT to look at this young diagram basis, where you just take linear combinations of these trace bases uh, weighted by characters of this SK, K being related to the degree of that, in, of that uh, polynomial in X. Uh, so the characters come up and uh, the and this particular combination of chi r sigma sigma is basically a proportional to a projector in the group algebra of sk these projectors are important they give you they give you a basis for the center of this group algebra of sk so this young diagram operator is basically a multiplication of x tensor k with the projector and then tracing everything so that's a good way to think about these uh, young diagram operators. And you can use that to show that the two point function that comes from free field theory uh, is actually a diagonal in this, uh, uh, in this young diagram basis. And it pro follows from properties of projectors. So basically, you know, combinatorics of weak contractions is very algebraic. It's just related to these things I just told you about. And another aspect is that uh, this orthogonality and this whole construction can be understood using sure vial duality. And this, is, this comes up because, you know, we had all these indices, K indices in the axis. So that transforms as the fundamental tensor K. So you decompose that in terms of UN. Uh, you can decompose it as a direct sum of uh, young diagrams, representation of UN. And the multiplicities of UN representations is precisely controlled by SK representations. So on the right hand side, there's a basis given by uh, states in a UN irrep and an SN irrep. So using that is another way to understand this. Uh, uh, you know, so once you know how things transform, you have upper uh, uh, representations and lower representations. You think about how how do I build an invariant? And that leads to this formula, very useful formula. Great. So what I'll do in this talk then is to talk about some holographic and many body quantum physics aspects of permutation invariant in matrix quantum mechanics. So I'll start with a standard matrix harmonic oscillator, uh, and which it's a standard one. So it has actually UN or even UN square symmetry, uh, the Hamiltonian itself. But a subgroup of that symmetry is SN. And you can ask, how do I look at the permutation invariant sector uh, and describe it? So we will do that and we'll use concretely partition algebras to do that. And then we'll look at more general Hamiltonians, such as a most general harmonic oscillator, which is permutation invariant, 
or other kinds of interesting uh, uh, Hamiltonians which separate the invariant sector dynamically from the non-invariant sector. And finally, we'll look at how this whole setup allows you to realize something called quantum many-body scars uh, or symmetry-based mechanisms of quantum many-body scars. This is a subject that has come up in theoretical condensed matter physics. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there'll be SN. So N is the size of the matrix. Uh, I'll be replacing the usual conjugation by UN with conjugation by SN. Okay. And then SK will come up if I have degree K, you know, polynomial invariance of degree K. So you, in the usual theory, you have UN and SK. Here you're going to have UN replaced by SN and something else depending on K, which is the, going to be the partition algebra. So, so, so that, that, that two things, two kind of things going on here. So this is the key thing. So the usual gauge symmetry, UN is going to be replaced by SN. Uh, and once you have fixed your gauge symmetry, you can classify invariance by degree. Uh, and there's a whole tower of degrees, K okay, from one to and so on. And when you're looking at degree K, this is an important symmetry. Again, when you look at degree K here, this is an important, PKN is an important symmetry. Sorry? Uh, you mean characters of UN? Yeah. They, they are basis of, yeah, conjugation invariant function. No, no, so, so we did, we did. Uh, you, you, we did that, and that's exactly what we did here in this construction of operators uh, here. We use the characters. These are the characters of SN. I'm just saying, explaining why, given that you have a, a UN problem, how did characters of SK come up? And, and the reason it came up has to do with Schuval duality, one way to understand it. And it turns out that this formula is when you replace UN by uh, SN, there is an analog of that where this is replaced by a representation, not of SK, but of this partition algebra. So, so that, that'll be the tool that allows you to make progress in the S, uh, SN problem. This duality, this hidden algebra, uh, which is related. There's one such algebra for each degree. Okay, so the simplest harmonic oscillator is uh, with matrices is just uh, dtxij dtxij minus a mass term uh, and uh, there's a Hamiltonian you can write these uh, oscillators in terms of the moment the, these xij's and their corresponding uh, conjugate momenta and you find the Hamiltonian of this form this has un symmetry where n acts as ux u dagger it even has un square symmetry which won't be too important here uh, but this un contains sn so this is also SN invariant. It's not the most general SN invariant Hamiltonian, and we'll get to the most general thing, uh, general quadratic term in the next part. For now, I just want to look at this one and uh, just think about the Hilbert space a little bit. So you have these oscillators, you have polynomials, and you can uh, take arbitrary linear combinations of these weighted by some, some Ts, some tensors with upper and lower indices. So these tensors are themselves linear operators in tensor space. And then basically the general state here will be labeled by a tensor T. These are the coefficients of these general states, uh, which you can also write in an index free way using operators in tensor space. Uh, so again, because of these uh, bosonic symmetry, there's an SK symmetry. So the most general states uh, are given by tensors subject to this SK invariance. Uh, and then you can count it. You can count the dimension of the Hilbert space at a given degree. Uh, it's just N square oscillators. So there's a very simple formula. Now we want to think about which of these states are S, not just SK invariant from bosonic symmetry, but also this SN gauge symmetry. So we want to conjugate these tensors by linear operators for SN action, uh, which acts on all these indices. So I have an SN action on all these upper indices and SN action on all the lower indices. So this turns out in the formula, it looks like this. Simplify it a little bit. 
it turns out you're requiring this tensor to commute with uh, this action of permutation SN in the scaffold tensor product. And that's just saying that, that the tensor must commute with the action of SN, so it's part of the commutant. And that's, that is well a known result, the full commutant uh, algebra of SN acting in, in the scaffold tensor product. So the thing that commutes with SN acting here is the partition algebra. So there's some, some linear operator that uh, commutes with the SN. Uh, basically, they, there's a diagrammatic description of these linear operators. So think of these as uh, operators in tensor space. So if this is I one prime I one, let's say I, I indices lower, J indices below, uh, this I index is contracted with this J index. It's just a delta symmetry identity, which is actually part of the S2 symmetry. So I'm looking at PKN for degree two here, where K is two. So the usual thing, the usual commuting SK uh, that you find when you have UN symmetry is there, but there are these more general contractions of upper and lower indices, and all of these commute with the SN action on, on VN tensor two. So when I have Vn tensor two, there's an algebra P2n, and I've drawn all the diagrams of P2n here. Uh, these form an algebra, and you can multiply them by stacking diagrams, and there's a rule for take this diagram and sort of find a way to erase the middle dots. Uh, and, and the way you do that is you keep track of where the lower dots go, uh, and you get a diagram of the same form. If there's a connected component in the middle all by itself, there's a power of n. So this algebra depends on n explicitly. So likewise, for the bosonic symmetry of k copies of x leads you to look at a subalgebra, which is sk invariant. Uh, so you look at something in the partition algebra, you average them by this conjugation, you get something sk invariant. So the Schubal duality is well known uh, in the math literature. This, these are some papers, more complete references in the paper. K fold tensor product, you have the group of interest, and then you have a dual uh, algebra, which is PKN. And using that algebra within that algebra, you can compute projector like things, uh, which are called the matrix units of this algebra. So there's a kind of a representation theoretic basis uh, for the algebra, uh, and one can use that to give a rep theory basis of the algebra. And then you can also get a rep theory basis of this SK invariance by using branching coefficients for the decomposition from PKN to SK. Details are not important, but just the group theory stuff gives you some natural projectors in that uh, algebra. And you can use these uh, thinking to compute what is the dimension of SN invariant polynomials of degree K. Uh, there's some explicit formula in terms of sums over partitions. And then this is one way of thinking about it. And then other, this rep theory where it gives you another kind of counting formula. And this counting formula matches with this rep theory basis. So what it is, is this is rep theory basis labeled by a representation of PKN, a representation of the subalgebra SK, along with the multiplicity indices for the multiplicity of that reduction. Okay, so it's a very natural thing uh, that would come up if you're doing SK invariance. So it turns out that what are the properties of these things? When you take uh, the two-point function, so take a, something made out of creation operators with one uh, partition algebra diagram, uh, take an overlap with something made out of uh, annihilation operators and another diagram, and you, there's a concrete formula for it in terms of tensor spaces and uh, partition algebra elements acting there. And you can use that to prove that in the large n limit, this is only one, this is, this is one, if the two diagrams are in the same SK equivalence class, and it's zero otherwise, and the corrections are one over root n. So this is large n factorization for SN. Uh, and uh, also, so this inner product is just coming from the basic simplest harmonic oscillator, matrix harmonic oscillator. These Q projector-like elements, you can also contract them with a dagger to the power K uh, and build a quantum state there. And it turns out, you see here, you had an approximate large n orthogonality here, you get an exact orthogonality. So all these labels for SN and SK have to be equal for this two-point function or this overlap to be non-zero, delta functions there. 
uh, and there's a normalization that can be computed. So orthogonality of rep periodic basis, large end factorization, both hold in this case. Okay, so now we move on beyond the simplest harmonic oscillator, where this is the usual xij, xij. You might ask, what does such a uh, harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian look like? When if this is the most general quadratic function, uh, of, uh, which is invariant on the permutations. There's a nice combinatoric answer to that. Essentially, to get S n invariance, you have to sum over these indices. And uh, this is a sort of a very brainy inspired picture. For each index, you have a dot. And uh, for each M, you have an, an edge. It's a directed graph. And if you have sum over M i i square, that's one invariant function. It corresponds to this graph. I j square, you've got that guy. M i j j k is that guy. Turns out there are exactly 11 quadratic functions. So there's an 11 parameter family of uh, harmonic oscillators with permutation invariance. As usual, when you have some quadratic Hamiltonian, you can you have to diagonalize it. And it is the way to diagonalize it is to take this tensor product, this xij, which transforms as vn tensor vn. You have to decompose it into e reps. And that decomposition into Sn e reps is known. And there are some associated Klebs Gordon coefficients. And uh, you can use that to write a simple form for this uh, quadratic potential using these representations of Sn that appear in the tensor product. And then you, this, this very simple low, low dimensional matrices now appear, this coupling constants. Uh, the low dimensional matrices have to do with these multiplicities, uh, uh, two, three, one, one. So they're very easy to diagonalize. And uh, you diagonalize the matrices, you get some uh, frequencies, you can calculate the partition function uh, in terms of these frequencies, which diagonalize this coupling matrix. So basically, you, you can solve the, quadrat the general harmonic oscillator. Now, you might say, okay, what other interesting Hamiltonians could I be interested in? Uh, so, you know, uh, in, in this matrix harmonic oscillator, either the simplest one or these more complicated ones, you know, you, ha you have polynomials in this A dag IJ, you can restrict to SN invariance, but the, in the simplest harmonic oscillator, the energy is just the degree. So some of these degree K states are SN invariant, some are not. So there's no separation between the SN invariants in the simplest harmonic oscillators. But, so you can build, so typically, you have sort of, you know, typically in this harmonic oscillator or simple Hamiltonians, you'll have some spectrum where some states are going to be SN invariant. Let's say the blue ones and the black ones are not SN invariant. They're sort of mixed up with each other. Uh, so you might want to know, can I build a Hamiltonian where, you know, things are all the SN invariant, the whole multiplicity of SN invariant states is the set of ground states. All SN invariant states up to some degree k that you choose. And then above, there'll be some spectrum like that. So you can engineer Hamiltonians and condensed matter physicists want to engineer interesting Hamiltonians governed by symmetries and so on. So you can engineer such a Hamiltonian uh, by taking, you know, you have a SN acting by adjoint action. Uh, essentially, when you want to control representations, separate the invariant and the non-invariant, you have to use some kind of Casimir which whose eigenvalues depend on the representation. So the Casimir-like things in the case of group algebra of Sn uh, are central elements in the group algebra, which can be obtained by taking sums over conjugacy classes. So here I'm taking the sum over all permutations, which are simple swaps. The eigenvalues of these are known from the mathematical literature, and you have these permutations acting in the tensor power. Uh, if you have degree k, uh, variables in X, you have 2K indices. So you get tensor 2K. These permutations are acting there. The eigenvalues of these operators are known from group theory. And also Schuh weil duality allows you to kind of write this sum, which looks somewhat complicated because I and J can go from one to capital N and it's an SN problem. But because of Schuh weil duality, you can write this complicated looking sum, well, you know, we're interested in often in n goes to infinity, uh, in terms of this dual algebra. The thing about, the nice thing about the dual algebra, its dimension when n is much bigger than 2k is uh, independent of n, it just depends on k. The, the dimension of this when n is bigger than 2k 
is simply related to Bell numbers associated with K. So if K is finite, you are finite degree things and N is going to infinity, this is a good way to write these operators. And uh, in fact, what, what is quite convenient is that working with uh, operators, thank you, working with operators in uh, this partition algebra and multiplying partition algebra elements and so on, can all, can all be automated. The nice programs available in uh, uh, Sage, the group theoretic software, uh, and uh, you know, so for example, you can use this kind of software to, to calculate these Q basis elements, these representation theoretic basis elements I was describing before. Uh, these again can be characterized using some eigenspaces of operators like this Casimir-like operators, which can detect lambda one, lambda two, and so on. So using Casimirs, basically, Casimir constructed Hamiltonians, you can separate uh, the invariant states from the remaining states. So the concrete formula are given in the paper, I won't get into the details. Within the SN invariant sector, or for polynomials of, of a degree up to K, you have these interesting multiplicities. You know, there's a large degeneracy of these ground states here, which is related to all the SN invariants, SN invariant polynomials. And I mentioned that you've got these bases, these representation theoretic bases for these SN invariant polynomials. Uh, and that you can, again, use Casimir's of, of SN or SK. Uh, so so there, there, there are, an important thing here is that there are two kinds of SN in this game. So sigma in SN, and then I'm X, I, J. And we are thinking about this tensor K. Uh, so there's an action of SN, which, which is the gauge symmetry, L X tensor K, L sigma inverse. So, so you want, for example, in this picture here, these states, you want them to be, sorry, what did I do? Ah, yeah. You want, you want these states to be invariant these are invariant under this adjoint action, which defines the gauge symmetry. Uh, but then within uh, these operators, which are invariant, you have these non-trivial uh, representation basis operators. Again, this is kind of related to SN uh, representation theory or PKN, which are dual. So when you have duality, the same label works for both. And this SN, well, if everything is invariant, there's no non-trivial lambda one, you say. But there's another, this kind of is related to the left action on X tensor K. So, so you should look at sort of UN invariant Casimir's for the left action as well as the adjoint action. So both left action and adjoint action come up. Uh, that's, simple, you know, this is from fact, just from what I said before, you have X's, Upper indices are contracted with lower indices in some way. So to make invariants on the action of UN on both, or in this case, SN on both. But in order to understand that, you want to understand how does the upper indices alone transform into SN or UN, and then the non-trivial representations. And then from each non-trivial representation, you have to pair it with the corresponding non-trivial representation below. So there are two kinds of just, you have to think about the action purely on one set of indices, as well as the action on both. So, so that's what's happening. You are looking at things that are invariant uh, under this adjoint action, but they still are non-trivial uh, representations of the left action. And you can again resolve them using appropriate Casimirs. So finally, I'll mention quantum many body scars. This is a topic of active interest in theoretical condensed matter physics. Some, uh, Particle physicists have also worked on it recently. There are references in the paper. The non-trivial thing about SCARs is that you have non-trivial collective states in a complex quantum system, which is not an integrable model, which nevertheless show periodic behavior. So you, you, you have a mini atom system, you build something uh, complicated and then Surprisingly, you discover this thing evolves and then comes back to where it was. It was first experimentally discovered, and then people uh, said, okay, how could this be possibly happening? 
so there are symmetry based mechanisms that people have uh, proposed. So you think about the Hamiltonian H and you have a system where there's some symmetry, but some states are invariant under that symmetry. Uh, and you have a Hamiltonian H which maps these invariant states to invariant states, and you can engineer H to be uh, periodic. But the full Hamiltonian of the system, and this is why it's not integrable, is that you've got this H uh, which maps invariant states to invariant states, but there's also a symmetry breaking term. So this whole thing, not a symmetric Hamiltonian, uh, but the symmetry breaking term has the property that when it acts on invariant states, it gives zero. So, thank you. so you can engineer such a Hamiltonian, such a Hamiltonian, and you can show that with this particular structure, uh, you can uh, uh, get this kind of behavior, non-trivial collective state. Uh, the whole Hamiltonian is not integrable because it has a symmetry breaking term, but the whole system, you know, you can use an, a symmetry to organize a Hilbert space uh, and this invariant sector has some special property. So it is useful to have some symmetry, which helps you organize all the states, but it is not the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So this is exactly what we have kind of are able to do with this, uh, you know, oscillator systems. The Hamiltonian can be whatever it is, but we just look at the polynomial in the oscillators and say, which ones are invariant, which ones are not, and you describe the invariant states. So that kind of gives you concrete descriptions of this invariant subspace when you are thinking about this SN symmetry. Uh, I've written some formulae here for exactly how this periodic behavior happens, not too important to get into this. Uh, and then this, this uh, uh, extra term, uh, which breaks symmetry, you can make sure that it, when it acts on invariant states, uh, it really does annihilate them by you know, taking the symmetry action of the group uh, here, SN, and then this will act on that invariant state, leave it, give you back itself. So it'll act as one on those invariant states. So if you have something like this, then you can build something which has this property that uh, the perturbation there does not, uh, that gives zero on that. So this was an idea explained in, in the paper of Klebanov. And so this gives you a concrete realization of this. Uh, and then, okay, so using this kind of Hamiltonian where you have uh, this sum of uh, H and then this uh, symmetry breaking term, you can look at uh, uh, an interesting uh, real, uh, concrete realization of that, where you think of these matrix oscillators A dagger IJ as creating bosons uh, on a square lattice where the points are labeled by IJ pairs, uh, and sort of N points, N rows and N columns. And you have A dagger IJ, which creates a boson on each of these lattice sites. This is the setup of what is called the Hubbard model. And uh, so you can realize the, uh, the scar thing with a deformation of the Hubbard model of this kind coming from SN symmetry. So what I've done in this talk is I've focused on matrix quantum mechanics uh, and with motivations from holography as well as condensed matter physics, we have looked at aspects of SN symmetry and we found things like large n factorization for a trace-like basis. Trace-like is defined in terms of partition algebras. Uh, orthogonal bases labeled by representation theory data, uh, again, using partition algebras. Casimir Hamiltonians with interesting uh, spectra and then realization of quantum many-body scars. Um, I guess in this audience, we, we often worry about BFSS, IKKT, so there are two, we can look at things in zero dimensions and one dimension. So this kind of permutation invariance, you can also look at permutation invariant matrix models in so zero dimensional models, if you like. Uh, and you have a 13 parameters, 11 parameters from the quadratic terms, there are two parameters from linear terms, the two SN invariants, linear, so you can have linear and quadratic. There are 13 parameter Gaussian matrix models. And actually some of the study of uh, permutation invariance was motivated by applications. So we were looking at back in 2017 uh, with collaborators in uh, computational linguistics, we, were, we had a very interesting problem. You know, there was a set of matrices. So let's say 300 matrices. Uh, each of them 
size, a thousand by a thousand. So you have it, an ensemble of matrices. And each matrix corresponds to a real world thing. In this case, it was a word uh, for, for collection of words. They have data science ways of constructing a matrix for every word. So you have uh, 300 matrices of size a thousand by a thousand. And there were reasons to expect that this collection of matrices, the way you build them, there was nothing about UN or, or orthogonal group symmetry in the construction, but there was some hint that this construction had a hidden SN symmetry because the way this, this data was constructed was by looking at how a word occurs in the, in the vicinity of other words and the, the ordering of that, word, that set of words was not important. So there was a kind of a real world construction where SN symmetry was uh, natural. So we started looking at Gaussian models with SN symmetry and we found good evidence, uh, very convincing evidence that the data did respect Gaussianity. So you look at you know, linear and quadratic expectation values, you fit it to a Gaussian model, and then you see if the Gaussian model predicts cubic and quartic expectation values. Uh, and it turned out it worked very well. So, so there are real world applications of these kinds of matrix models. Uh, and for the future, it'll be interesting to look at beyond Gaussian models in this data science setup, or motivated by this data science setup, you know, find computational or analytic ways to compute uh, models with Gaussian plus perturbations. Uh, these orthogonal bases I've described are for the simplest Hermitian, a simplest matrix model harmonic oscillator, but orthogonal basis for the general one is something to be done. Uh, and then, you know, there are these scar models which should be studied. So I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much. And now it's time for questions, comments, remarks, please. I have a technical question. Yeah. You have multiforms and matrices. Yeah. And uh, the diagonal subgroup of SN to the power of something is acting on these multiforms. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that involves reduction product reduction problem of SN representations. That's right. So far as I know, it is an un unsolved problem in mathematics. No. So so I'll, I'll, we have very concrete references where this formula comes from. Uh, you take, you know, the, so this is a key math input, and this has been worked out in the in the last twenty years. You know, this is this is active research. So you take this fundamental of SN, take the k-fold tensor power, uh, you decompose it into a bunch of representations of uh, SN. In fact, this this has a nice simplicity when n is large uh, and k is small. Okay, let's take k is one. You know, you're just going to get the the vn the natural representation decomposes into the trivial the young diagram this guy and the trivial with one box below one neat fact is that if you take the k fold tensor product where k is small you get young diagrams where you have a bunch of boxes and below you have a small young diagram with no more than k boxes so the, the stability properties of these represent this relates to stability properties of sn representation theory so when k is Small compared to large n, the nice simplifications, and this, this, and this is a general result about like Schuval duality for generalized to SN, and these papers, you know, uh, it's actively being studied, and we are using some of these results. What? Okay, I'll check. But there is an old book by a New Zealand mathematician. Yes. Not remember, yes. It was very complicated yes. when he tries to. Yeah. SN representations. Yeah, but you know, I think these guys, mathematicians, have been working hard, and I think they, well, they have made useful progress. And as I said, you know, this partition algebra, you can work with it. You know, just put in some commands. You know, find find the products of partition algebra element, find representations. Uh, this this can all be done computationally. You just put it in this uh, Sage. Uh, so our paper has references to this code. It, it comes with code, everything. So. Okay, so next question, Harold, please. Harold, yes. Harold. Hi. Um, so in the end of your talk, you mentioned the Hubbard model. So I'm kind of curious, is this, are you saying that these kind of methods are useful to study the Hubbard model or something like that? So we got as far as, you know, so, uh, well, you know, uh, I think broadly speaking, the, you know, the this double commutant or Schuval duality 
it's a very, very general thing. And in fact, there are papers in condensed matter physics that uh, you know, use double combinant theorem. I was just reading one a few days ago. Um, so basically, this, double, this thing is very, this, this is key, right? So let me just show it to you again. Basically, so this is and k fold tensor power of a given uh, representation. Uh, you, are, you have any symmetry. So, so what is known in, in general, whenever you have a representation, some large reducible representation of some symmetry, uh, this decomposes uh, you know, some label for the representation of that group. And then you have kind of a dual algebra. Uh, let me call it G star. And uh, this is a very general fact, the double commutant theorem. No, no, sure. But yeah. this very specific Hubble model, it's very difficult problem and people have, you know, so I'm just wondering if, if this kind of thing helps to understand better this very specific oh, okay. model. So, you know, this, I, you know, my connection to condensed matter physics is as far as I told you. So, so we just found, uh, you know, this scar realization uh, in the Hubbard uh, and realized it as a deformation of the Hubbard model. We haven't tried to solve that deformation or, or learn enough about the Hubbard model to really know about the big picture. But it, it, these are all interesting things to think about. Yeah. It, it, what, what the, the key idea is that using oscillators A dagger IJ and thinking about SN invariance is, is relevant to deformations of the Hubbard model. Yeah. Okay, one last question. There is a problem in, um, in identical theory of identical particles in quantum information. So if I take Paris, for example, parastatistics, so parastatistics of order n, and um, I uh, take a number of particles obeying parastatistics of order n, and I have a uh, state on this algebra. Mm -hmm. If I try to find what is the state on k of these objects, k subspace, the partial trace gives wrong answers because that is not the partial trace does not commute to the action of a yeah? mm -hmm. So that is the wrong thing. You have to restrict the state to subalgebra. And that is a different process than taking partial traces. Mm -hmm. I am wondering whether your method will solve that problem completely. I'd be very happy to discuss. Okay. So just so I understand more precisely the problem, but yeah, I'd be happy to discuss it. Okay, so we thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much. And we move to the next talk. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Just working? Yeah, it's working. So the second talk of the morning will be by Christian Zeman, and it's about T-duality with categor categorified principle bundles. Difficult words, yeah, <laughs> please. So uh, first of all, let me start by thanking the organizers for putting, organizers for putting on this beautiful conference again. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, second of all, let me thank the audience for making it here to my talk uh, in the, what was it called, the Greek morning after the Greek night. <laughs> um, so the title sounds a little bit technical. Uh, there, there's a little bit of technical background, but I hope that I'll, I'll explain it in, in detail and lure you a little bit into this beautiful world of higher dimension algebra categorification. We already saw quite a bit in the talks of Pranjo Yocho and, uh, <clears throat> and others, right? We saw L-infinity algebras, we saw quantum L-infinity algebras, we saw um, uh, graded manifolds. So some, some aspects you've already seen. This is kind of a finite version of all this. So we really want to look at principal bundles with finite groups and categorify them. And I would like to explain how T-duality can be seen from this perspective. Should say that this is joint work with my PhD student, Kyono Kim. Um, he's very excellent at, uh, at, at conceptual work, certainly. I mean, he's, he's been amazing throughout this project and all the other projects. So if you ever should see him applying for a postdoc position and you have conceptual work to be done, hire him immediately. No, no questions asked, essentially. Okay, so um, T-duality, the motivation, I guess most of you are familiar, have heard at least a little bit about T-duality. The traditional story is that you look at string theories on a background with a um, circular isometry, right? Compact direction, you want isometry. And then you can exchange the winding and momentum modes and you get a T-dual partner to this background, 
So this background comes with another background that's key dual to it. And the string theory on both of these backgrounds is equivalent. Um, the interesting point of this duality or why it's so interesting is, is <clears throat> that it qualitatively separates strings from particles. Particles can't experience key duality, strings can, right? So, so that is the difference and this is a key, um, key factor of creating interest in this. Um, but there are altogether, there are many, many reasons for studying T-duality because the structures that arise are very, very interesting from a number of perspectives. First of all, of course, if you want to understand better strings, you have to have a firm handle on T-duality, and that was the original motivation. My motivation comes a little bit from this point. So I was, or I have been interested uh, a lot in higher bundles and higher gerbs for various um, applications to higher gauge theory with connection and uh, this is actually a very, very nice application of the technology that we um, well pushed a little bit over the last years. Um, furthermore, for this conference, of course, uh, T-duality can map ordinary geometry to non-commutative or even non-associative geometries or some, some other way of describing these non-geometric backgrounds, right? So ordinary geometry really creates in string theory non-geometric backgrounds. Um, and I think that that's probably the main reason why you will, might be interested in if you attend this conference. And there's lots of mathematical relations, uh, mathematical um, uh, reasons for being interested, like this close relation to Fourier Mukai transform. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the important thing is that T duality really, because of these U1 isometries, it really needs to be studied on non trivial topologies, and that automatically involves uh, studying, um, studying principal bundles instead of just trivial vibrations. Okay, so I will make a couple of approximations. I want to string theory. I won't even do supergravity, but I'll do the following. So we said that we need to look at string theories on backgrounds with U1 isometries. If you take the low energy limit, then you get um, supergravities on certain circle bundles. So that's a little bit of a reduction, right? But we can be fairly general here if you're interested. We can do a fine principle circle bundles. That's all good. Um, I'll assume that the metric that is on this background will come from a kind of Klein metric on connection on the circle bundle. And then in, in the supergravity description of the low energy limit, you have this two form B field. And this two form B field is really gauge potential. And you know, just as a one form gauge potential describes power transport along, um, along lines, this describes power transport along surfaces. And the mathematical object that is um, capturing this, the replacement of a principal um, circle bundle for an abelian one for potential, there's an abelian two for potential, is a gerb or an abelian gerb, whatever you want to call this. And don't worry if you don't know this uh, word, I'll define this, uh, how, how this is defined later, and it, it's a fairly simple definition. So to me, a geometric string background will just be um, just a Riemannian manifold, um, then a principle or affine torus bundle. Let's stick to principle for this talk, we can, we can expand this uh, quite a bit. A torus bundle over this Riemannian manifold with connection, and then an abelian gerb with connection that lives on the total space of this torus bundle, right? So, so I mean, this torus bundle is responsible for describing the U1 isometries and the gerb on the total space of this bundle will capture this B field that I have around and will capture the topological aspect, right? Because also the B field can be topologically non-trivial and the gerb is responsible for capturing that. We will throughout, we'll ignore completely any dynamics of so these backgrounds will not be solutions of uh, string theory or solutions of supergravity. There's no equations of motion imposed. We'll just do that um, at the purely geometric level, at the level of kinematical data, if you want. Okay, so let me start with topological T-duality to highlight um, the problems or the, the features that arise, the interesting features that actually arise from non-trivial topology. And um, the story goes as follows. So here we have our Riemannian manifold. We have the principal circle bundle over it, and we have a gerb sitting on top of that principal bundle. And from the uh, from topological perspectives, so characterizing the, the, the bundles up to isomorphisms and the gerb up to isomorphisms, um, the principal bundle, as you know, the circle bundle is characterized by its first churn class, which is an element in the second cohomology group, values in Z. And the abelian gerb is just, you go one step up in the cohomology, so the third cohomology group. The principal bundle lives on X, so this is why X appears here. The gerb lives on P, this is why P appears here, right? So these are the two um, characterizing features that we have that we need to deal with. So the inventors of topologic T duality, I guess, is essentially these four people and it arose in, in 2004. And as Peter Bauknecht always stresses and all of them actually stress, the topological T duality is really due to uh, the exactness of the Giesen sequence or whenever you have a Giesen sequence that's, that's interesting, 
then you get topological T duality. The Giesen sequence is this exact sequence in cohomology. And don't worry too much. It's, it's just a map that allows you to map elements in these cohomology groups into other elements. And the sequence is exact. That it means whatever the image is here is in the kernel of the next map. OK, so now let's apply this to construct the topological T dual for our original construct, right? I mean, this is our original data that we had here. And in particular, we have this three form H3PZ. And then we see the Giesen sequence has uh, this one living here. And what we can do is we can push this forward down to the base space. And this is literally fiber integration, right? I mean, if you think about this three form, you can think of it up to torsion terms. You can think of this as a, a three form that lives on the total space of this principal bundle. And of course, I can integrate this along the circle fiber of uh, this principal bundle. I just perform the integration uh, because you integrate it along one direction, you lose one form degree and you fall down to a two form. And this is exactly what this push forward here uh, means, right? So if I push this forward, I get an element in H2XZ. But uh, this is exactly where the first turn classes of circle bundles live. So just by considering this push forward from this H, I constructed the churn class of another principal circle bundle over X, right? So I get this F hat just from the push forward of this three form. Now what I can do is I can look at this image that I constructed here. And because the sequence is exact, I know that the cup product here has to map this F hat, which I constructed into zero, right? I mean, the cup product, again, if you go up to torsion, if you, if you look at the, at the level of, of differential forms, it's just a wedge product of the corresponding two forms that encode the first churn class. So because we have this relation that this, um, uh, you, you know, we worked originally with this check bundle here, right? So this was all check. So this was an F check. We had F check with what we constructed, which was the F hat is zero, but the cup product is symmetric, just like the wedge product for two forms can interchange the role. So what I know now is that this F check that characterized this is the push forward of some three form, right? And this three form now constructs a new jerk for me, okay? So in the total process, what have I done? Well, I started from a bundle and a gerb on top of it. I, uh, yeah, and I, I swapped it essentially for another bundle with another gerb on top of it. And the topological charges have been exchanged, right? And now you see that there is a possibility for severe topology change, right? The bundle has, uh, the, the trunk class of the bundle completely changed in the dismidatory class of, of the gerb. And therefore, any discussions that just as you find often in literature at first, right, in the, in the early literature that you just take M cross S1 or so, or uh, non trivial vibration, is certainly not sufficient. I really need to have the job there to describe full T duality. All right, so, so mathematicians entered the picture, or further mathematicians entered the picture, I should say. And what they did is they took this picture, so we have this picture down here, and they extended it by putting a correspondence space on top of it, right? So this is just a fiber product. So you take the, both of these uh, circle bundles, but you, you identify it uh, up to things that are over the same point. And what you can then do is you can pull back these gerbs up to the correspondence space. And uh, the statement of T-duality is then that they're isomorphic and that this isomorphism is captured by the so-called Poincaré line bundle that sits on top of them. Right? So this is a very nice characterization of, of T-duality, and it's very closely related to what, what Pranio actually told you about having you know, one BV theory, another BV theory, and some mother theory, and then you have quasi-isomorphism between these. All right. But now uh, the, the, the really nice step that the basis for what I'm going to tell you about was done by, by Konrad Nikolaus and uh, Thomas Wal uh, by Thomas Nikolaus and Konrad Waldorf in 2018. And the idea is the following that. I mean, you have here all this structure that is separate, right? I mean, you have a principal bundle and a gerb on top of it. So why not try to combine all of this into a single structure? And indeed, you can do that. You can combine this principal circle bundle and the gerb into something that's called a principal two bundle. But um, the technology that they had available or the technology that's readily available in literature up to 2018 essentially allowed you to do that only at the topological level. Because the natural question then is to ask, what happens if we put connections on these? Because the connections actually define also the metric via the color the Klein metric and the B field. And then we should be able to describe the full T duality, right? Not just the topological T duality, but actually the full T duality. Okay, so they had topological T duality captured in terms of these principal two bundles, which are combinations of these principal circle bundles with the gerb. Yeah?
Yes, exactly. Right. Precisely. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, in principle, you have a little bit more. You have torsion as well, if you want to be strict. But yeah, H field is, is good enough for most applications. Okay, so there are two open problems uh, that that arise, or two 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 questions from their construction that you would immediately ask. Um, first of all, as I already mentioned in the introduction, T duality can lead to non-geometric backgrounds. Backgrounds that are described in terms of non-commutative geometry, some are described in terms of non-associative geometry. And you usually classify these backgrounds around uh, by roughly speaking, how many legs your H field has along the fiber direction. And if there's no leg, T duality doesn't do anything. If H is, uh, has one leg, then you get another geometric string background from a geometric string, string background. If you have two legs, then you get so-called Q spaces, which are sometimes modeled in terms of non-commutative manifolds. So there's these non-commutative torus vibrations that, that appear in the literature. They are locally still geometric, can be described as locally geometric, but they're clued together via T duality transformations. And then there's the last case, which is a scary one, which is not even locally geometric. So Nicholas and Waldorf co cover the geometric to geometric topological T dualities and geometric to the, these ones, right? So, so, so they have a first uh, window into the non geometric backgrounds, but again, at the topological level. The second, um, the second open question is the differential refinement. So putting connections on top of these principal circle bundle and on top of the gerb, because that allows you then in principle, if that all works, if this is nice, then it should be allowed to, to not only describe topological T-duality, but in fact, full T-duality um, for arbitrary topologies, which would be a nice step forward. Um, so why is this interesting or hard? Well, first of all, this requires to go from principle two bundles to um, uh, higher group points and augmented group points. Um, don't, don't be scared. I mean, these constructions are incredibly straightforward if you just look at them from the right perspective. Um, and they, they were focusing, not too much, but they, they were focusing on these principle two bundles and you can't get further with this. And even the F1 case can be fully covered uh, using just two bundles. And the other thing is this issue of putting connections on principle two bundles. And often you require for this something that we call an adjustment that's, well, it has been known for a long time in special cases. But we, we formulate it a little bit more abstractly and then becomes transparent what you should actually do. Okay, quick outline. Um, I'll briefly give an introduction to categorified principal bundles, very gentle, and don't worry. I mean, uh, this is more meant to lure you into this field of higher dimensional algebra. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this adjustment problem on connections of principal two bundles on non abelian gerbs, uh, simply because they have a little bit of a bad reputation, at least in the string theory community, I would say. Um, then I describe how geometric T-duality is fully done for arbitrary topologies in terms of these principle two bundles. And then I quickly sketch how the non-geometric um, backgrounds are done. Uh, it gets a little bit technical, but the idea is, is very, very simple and it's also very, very nice. So, so I'll just sketch this. And um, what is nice about this whole, of, of, about these results I find is that everything can be made very, very explicit. I mean, usually if you talk about um, uh, categorified uh, objects and so on. You get abstract uh, commutative diagrams and so on, but uh, it takes you a lot of time to unwrap what it really means. In this case, no, in this case, everything is very, very down to earth and very, very explicit. You can write on formulas, really just ordinary co-cycles. You can directly calculate with them, right? There's nothing hidden in an abstract classifying space or so. It's, it's all very down to earth. Okay, so principle two bundles or non abelian jokes with adjusted connection. Um, the problem with higher parallel transport is well known, has been studied over the years. Uh, there were mathematical results. Physicists rediscovered a lot of things over the years in the 80s. Um, so we have this two form. And as I said, that means a higher parallel transport along a surface instead of along a line. And the abelian case is relatively easy. But um, in our case, we need to combine this with the principle U1 bundle. And that makes the gerb, even though everything is abelian, the B field is abelian and the circle bundle is abelian, it makes them non abelian in a particular way, right? So, um, in principle, we need the non abelian gerbs. And the non abelian power transport is much harder. In particular, if you have power transport, um, the ordinary power transport, you have path ordering. And the uh, correct definition of surface ordering is, is not possible. You have to be very careful with this. And uh, then one gets pro problems, and there's an old argument by Eichmann and Hilton that if you do that improperly, if you don't do the use the right technology, then your parallel transport, even if you try to make it non-abelian, will be abelian. Okay, so one has to be a little bit careful here. But um, if you look at the structure, then you immediately led to a categorification because you have like endpoints of the strings uh, of, of, of objects that you want to parallel transport, which you can regard as arrows. And you have uh, other arrows between these, and that immediately leads to something that looks like a two category, right? 
So uh, let me not go into further detail, just believe me for now, categorification is the word to go with these bundles. So what's categorification? Categorification is a very, very nice uh, way of playing with mathematical structures. What one way of studying mathematical structures, certainly deforming them, right? That has been a very popular technique, just to see if you got to capture the essence of a mathematical object. Another very nice way of playing with them is categorification, which is also generalization to see if you capture the essence of your mathematical object that you're um, studying. So remember that usually, I mean, if you're an old fashioned Bobaki style, uh, mathematical structures consist of sets, right? Underlying sets that, that give you your object, then you have structure functions on the set, and then you have structure equations that your structure functions satisfy. And you can define essentially any mathematical structure in this way, right? By, by bundling this together. And categorification is now a very straightforward operation. In principle, you take the sets, you take them to categories, the structure functions become structure functors. Functors are nothing but maps between categories, of course. And then you have structure equations, they become structure isomorphisms, which are relations between functors. Um, yeah, so, so as an example, let's do that quickly for a group. Uh, and we get a two group. So for a group, you have usually a set. Okay, let's replace it by some category. The structure functions are the product map, the identity, and the inverse. I mean, the identity is usually preferred object, but in category theory, the mantra is always it's better to work with morphisms instead of uh, objects. So we always uh, regard this as a particular morphism into our group. And yeah, we, we can, can generalize these two particular functors. And then the structure equations as well, uh, the product is associative. So we get a corresponding structure isomorphism, which is called the associator. There's this unit relations. We get uh, isomorphisms called unitors. And there's a relation for the inverse. And then we get these weak inverse relations, essentially. Um, the process is not unique. And you need to put a little bit more data in. You need to then get coherence diagrams for your structure isomorphism. And there are various variants to what extent you want to categorify. Usually what you do, some of these isomorphisms, you just choose to be uh, trivial and then you get for example unital two groups right so, so so you just choose your unitors to be trivial um but the associator is certainly a good thing to keep okay so this is in principle straightforward thing and you can do it apply to to any mathematical structure and then you get a higher version of that and then you can iterate this and then you get higher versions higher versions and you get infinity uh, versions and ultimately so if that was a little bit too abstract hopefully not but essentially what you're doing is you're doing higher dimensional algebra so in a group you can multiply ordered elements in one dimension. And in a two group, you can multiply in two directions. Namely, you can multiply vertically and horizontally. So if you look at these arrows here, right, I can compose them in this direction, but I can also compose them in, in this direction, have pairs of arrows together. And so you can multiply in two directions. And if you do that in n groups, then you can multiply in n dimensions. So an example is the key player uh, in this whole construction that we have ma uh, made is this two group TDN. And I don't flash it for you to, to read through what these actually are. I just want to show that all of these things are really down to earth objects and they're very precisely given. So R2N is harmless, U1 set to N, R2N. And so these are the morphisms. They map from two between points here in R2N. And explicitly how this works is, is given here. So Xi is a point in R2N. This is one of these morphisms. And you see, this is the source. It maps this point to that point. And this here tells you how the composition works. So what we call vertical multiplication in this group. And uh, these are the other functors that we need. This horizontal composition, this is the inverse, right? But you see the formulas are all there, right? It's explicit, there's nothing abstract. You can just calculate within directly. All right, so we need to go to principal fiber bundles. Topologically, how do you describe them? <clears throat> Essentially, all definitions of principal bundles have a higher version. Take your favorite definition, put it through the machinery and you get a higher version. Um, some are easier than others. We want to work with, at first with topological bundles. So a very nice description is uh, using check co-cycles, right? So, so like transition functions for principal bundles, we do the same. So uh, remember for this, we need a subjective subversion on our base space. Think of it as a cover, but we don't need to use ordinary covers. Um, then we can construct the so-called check groupoid. So this very simple category where the objects are just the patches, the various patches that we have, and the morphisms are just overlaps of patches that you have between them, right? And then you can obviously compose them. They have obvious inverse, and then you get a category. And because the morphisms are invertible, we call this thing a groupoid, right? So what's the principal G bundle? From this perspective, it is very, very simply uh, a functor from this check groupoid 
in the category that has one object and g worth of morphism, right? And the reason why this works so nicely is, well, you have overlaps mapping into the group uh, on the patches. Nothing is mapped. Well, you have trivial information because we just have the star here. And the fact that composition here uh, is compatible with composition here gives you the co-cycle relation for transition functions that they glue together nicely. And so what's particularly nice about this definition, <coughs> I can immediately generalize this to higher groups of arbitrary degree and also to higher group points of arbitrary degree. That means this, this idea, this little picture, once you have it, you can immediately define arbitrarily generalized higher group void bundles. Right? Moreover, I mean, these are the transition functions. And then it's not surprising if the transition functions are functors, then bundle isomorphisms, they should be relations between transition functions, right? They're then just natural isomorphisms. And essentially, the whole machinery gives you everything that you want to know topologically about these bundles, right? So um, if you want to have a principal two bundle, then you take a two group here, <clears throat> right? And then you get immediately a two category. So besides morphisms, you have also morphisms between morphisms. And then, I mean, this is just a sketch of this picture. You get a weak two functor, or you define a weak two functor between your check group point, trivially regarded as a higher group point, and this two group. And this immediately gives you what the co-cycle relations are. It just comes out. You don't have to worry. In the special case where just H is non-trivial and G is trivial, you get abelian gerbs. And in the special case where H is trivial, you just get principal bundles, right? And similarly, if I put something here, I get group point bundles. If all of this is non-trivial, I get two group void bundles. If I put here a whole tower, I get infinity group void bundles, right? But if everything is immediately contained in this picture and you have no wiggle room essentially in how you define these things, so that's all done. Okay, so for connections, you have to work a little bit harder. You'd have to do slightly more general things. And uh, the pioneers here were certainly Preen Messing and Askeri Cantini Yurcher. So we are happy to have uh, two of the pioneers here from back from 2005 in the audience. Um, and then you get additional co-cycle information, right? And the data looks like this. I mean, in a principal bundle, you would have transition function and one form potential. In uh, the non-abelian gerb, you have these, but you also get more. You get also over triple overlap, the gerb topological uh, co-cycles, right? Then uh, over double overlap, you get one forms that clue things together. And on each patch, you get a two form. And then in the construction, in, in, in both of these, actually, well, what comes out is that you have this additional two form over overlaps. And this is a little bit strange. It doesn't quite fit this, this picture, uh, uh, at least to my taste, right? So because usually you can always trade a form degree for one degree in, in overlaps, right? I mean, you see here, I have a double overlap. And if I want to go down to Y, I get an additional form degree. The same happens here, right? I have a zero forms on Y3, one forms on Y2, two forms on y and so on. So this sticks a little bit out. This seems to be a little bit, mm, what do we do with it, right? Um, and in later work then indeed by Val Schreiber and so on, everybody who ran with, with this high gauge theory, um, they indeed dropped it, <clears throat> but there's a little bit of a price to pay, uh, namely that the part of the curvature needs to vanish. And this is the source of a few issues. This is just to flash again that you can write down explicit co-cycle relations for all of this. And this all comes out and you get principal bundles as special cases and abelian gerbs as special cases, right? So, so the formalism is a generalization of abelian gerbs, principal bundles, and indeed does not abelian gerbs. So I mentioned this issue with um, the fake curvature vanishing, right? So, so this is zero. And so what happens without this condition? So why, why, why does this, is it there? Well, first of all, higher power transport is not reparameterization invariant without imposing this condition. And this is a severe problem. Then second, and let me be very, very careful how you formulate this because of the discussion with Paolo in the past. If you want to close gauge transformations and composition of co-cycles, you get this relation that needs to be satisfied. It's automatically satisfied if the co-cycle relations are satisfied. However, you see here that's a curvature term. And you see generically, there's no reason why this side should be zero. And however, if this is zero, then this is automatically satisfied. So in a lot of these configurations, at least, and, and a lot of them that we want to study, the fact that the co-cycle relations Im, Im, imply this relation also implies that the curvature is zero. And uh, another reason is if you're interested in, in five brains, that was my original motivation for studying these non-abelian gerbs, trying to find an action, low energy effective action for M5 brains. Uh, you need self-duality for the three form. And you see this is not compatible. This is not gauge covariant if the fake curvature is not zero in this picture. Okay, so without this condition, we can't live. That's imposed. What's so bad about imposing it? Well, um, first of all, 
you kind of do it non-homogeneously because uh, the principal bundle then becomes a flat principal bundle and we don't want that. And uh, more, more importantly is that high connections in this picture are locally abelian, right? So, so you can always gauge away the non-abelian part, which is kind of annoying because uh, of course we went through all this trouble to get non-abelian gerbs and you can always gauge away the, the A form at least locally, right? So, so topologically it's fine if you want to do higher transcendence theory and things like that. Yes, but um, if you want to do a little bit more then this is not so good. But uh, there's, a, there's a way out of this whole problem and there are a lot of these higher groups come with an additional structure, an additional map, uh, which we call an adjustment uh, that appears in, in work. So we had this in the infinitesimal version here, the final version is there. And uh, that is really an algebraic datum. If you're interested in this, it's responsible for defining Consistently invariant polynomials uh, in higher um, for higher groups. Uh, there's a there's some reason to believe that this comes from oh this comes from an alternator uh, in EL infinity algebra, but this this goes this this doesn't really help. So the full origin is certainly still mysterious. But uh, this additional structural information that you have, this additional algebraic information, allows you now to define connections to deform the co-cycle relations a little bit. And it specifies essentially this delta that was there. And that was a little bit unnatural in terms of the transition functions and the curvature. And this adjustment allows us to drop the fake flatness, right? So then fake flatness goes away. And this is really important because, thank you. Because as I said, uh, the fake flatness condition makes a bundle locally abelian. And that's why non-abelian jobs, I, I think that's one of the key reasons why non-abelian jobs got a little bit of a bad reputation in string theory because people tried that, so they couldn't get very far. Uh, or they, 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 it looked like it was locally abelian. And so, so they said, okay, that you don't get anything new. But with this adjustment, you get things that are new. And indeed, um, people in supergravity actually use this technology, right? So if you look at heterotic supergravity, there you have the two form B field that we have, but you also have an additional one form field. And they knew that you can't just use the, 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 the higher connection that you get from um, principal bundles. I mean, this was not even invented yet. But they naturally wrote down this coupling for the three form. They naturally wrote down DB, the, the coupling that you expect. This is the stuff that you get from the higher, uh, from the abstract higher discussion so far. And they said, no, 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 we need to combine this into the full Chern Simons term. And this is precisely what you get if you add this red term, which is an adjustment, right? So it's already in the physics literature. People are using that in the special case. And um, so we expect to have the adjustment there. Okay, so let's me now come to geometric T duality. Um, yeah, so as I said, Nikolaus and Waldorf had this, these principal two bundles, and uh, there are particular two groups that live here. So, so uh, these are principal two bundles for a two group they call TBF and 2N because it's F2 backgrounds. But the important player is really this PC that essentially encapsula encapsulates the whole T duality. This is a principal TDN bundle with this two group that I flashed before, right? And the interesting thing is that this T duality, so the projection here, is not really something that is induced by, uh, that, that, that is something much more fundamental because there's actually a map from the gauge groups, TDN, to this other gauge group or higher gauge group, TBF to N. And it is this map that induces the T duality map on the bundles, right? So T duality happens here at the level of the higher gauge groups for these higher bundles. right? And it induces that. Moreover, uh, well, T uh, well the, the projections are like this and the flip that that uh, incorporates t duality is a map from tdn to tdn and then you compose it with this so you get just from the maps between these two groups you get automatically this structure essentially for free okay so that that's their picture and it's absolutely yeah it's, it's, it's very very nice certainly that, that this works so now let's extend it let's differentially refine it and the first shock and that was very interesting for us is that this group doesn't come with an adjustment mm -hmm. thanks so this doesn't come with an adjustment, so we can't define connections and curvatures here. However, TDN comes with an incredibly natural adjustment map, right? They, in the definition of TDN, there is exactly the information that you need to extend it. And then you have higher connections here, and then you can show that the higher connections here and the higher gerbs that you want can be reconstructed in a very, very precise way from PC, right? So in this way, we have enriched this picture um, yeah, to, to a differentially refined picture, and we can do non-trivial T-duality. Okay, this is now what we claim, that we can do geometric T-duality in arbitrary backgrounds, or in, at least in arbitrary backgrounds that involve affine circle bundles. But Conrad, after our paper came out, then used the same technology, essentially modified it a little, 
and, and defined his own version of, of this non-trivial t-duality. And he did the hard computation that we avoided because we were stuck in another project. We didn't have the time to do that. So he really showed that this construction reproduces the Boucher rules locally. So this is exactly what you would like to have. So, so it's compatible with all the expectations for geometric t-duality that you would have. Okay, and then you can generalize this to a fine torus bundle, but this is a technicality. Um, as I said, everything here, the nice thing about this is that everything is explicit, right? This is not, I'm not hiding behind some, some abstract nonsense or so. I can write down everything to the last bit explicitly. And to show you that, let me quickly go through the example of 3D Neil manifolds. So uh, a Neil manifold is essentially a circle bundle over the two torus. And it's the standard example that you use in, in uh, topological t-duality. You have a job over that. The, the jobs are classified by an integer. The Neil manifolds are classified by an integer. There's coordinate description, local connection, colors the client metric. You can write all of this down trivially. Uh, also, the, the B field you can write down for, for these. Uh, it's not hard. And then to T-duality, you see it, it, it changes as expected the churn class of the Neil manifold with the dix duality class of the job, right? The K and the L get switched between these two. OK, and how does it look in our construction? Well, the Lee 2 group looks like this because we have one T duality direction. It's incredibly simple. I mean, that, that's, that's harmless, right? And then you write out the topological co cycle data and you just list them explicitly. The Xi and M just encode the bundles, the two bundles as you would expect. And then you have another gerb that doesn't really go for the right on top of it. So that's the topological part. For some reason, Conrad um, and Thomas didn't write the stuff, didn't give examples in their paper. So that, that's the topological code cycle. And, um, but you can also then differentially refine it. These are the one form potentials. And this is an addition. You can put B to zero, which is not too surprising because the gerb is not really taking too much part. It's just, just moderating how things work. And then you have a, a one form that glues things together. Um, what you see here is that K and L really appear on equal footing, right? So L and K is completely symmetric here, and here it's even multiplied, multiplied and symmetric, right? It's exactly what you want. And you can reconstruct both string backgrounds fully, right? So, so this is explicit examples, everything down to earth, everything explicit. Um, you have T duality for new manifolds geometric completely. Okay, so let me sketch the idea of um, the non commutative and uh, non, non geometric cases. Remember, we had all these backgrounds. And um, we, we, so far, I've done F2 for you, generic T-duality for F2. And uh, we would like to also do the others. The observation is that T-duality is essentially a Kaluza-Klein reduction. Remember, there was fiber integration in the Giesian sequence, right? So we're essentially doing Kaluza-Klein reduction. The metrics are Kaluza-Klein metric. There's lots of reasons why you should regard it as this. And OK, so we do Kaluza-Klein reduction of a B field. A two form start one dimension Kaluza Klein reduction, you get two form and a one form. Okay, so we get a Lee two group, combine them up into a non abelian two bundle. Um, two T duality directions, we get from the two form a two, a one, and a zero form. Okay, we have additional scalar fields, fine. Let's package them up in Lee two group void, right? I mean, if you had uh, ever studied gauge sigma models, right, you have a, a group void bundle essentially, right? You have scalar fields and you also have a gauge potential and they, they interact. You essentially have their group, group out bundle. Here you have a lead two group out bundle, additional scalar field. But then, and that's the interesting thing is, well, what about three T dualities? We get two form, one form, zero form, and minus one form. So what, 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 what is the minus one form? Well, remember that um, to a certain degree, we are interested in the curvatures of these things because these are the observable things. So a minus one form has a global zero form as a, a curvature, right? If you, if you count like this, right? And indeed, we can describe this. And if you translate this to mathematics, then here we already went through this, then the minus one field gives you a principal augmented two group point bundle. And let me show you what this looks like. Well, you essentially go to a, a simplicial description of higher categories because things become much easier. So every category can be re, um, regarded also as a simplicial, uh, particular simplicial set, as a Kahn simplicial set. And high group points are then Kahn simplicial manifolds. Um, high Lie group points are Kahn simplicial manifolds. So, so that's uh, additional technology. But then you have simplicial maps, right? I mean, here you have simplices. So here these are um, zero simplices, one simplices, two simplices. This is why you have all these arrows between them. And it's just equivalent to the picture I showed you before. It's just a reinterpretation. You have the same for the higher groups. And usually we stop here, right? So we stop here and we get, uh, if this is, so if these two are trivial, we just get a gerb. If these two are non-trivial, then we get a principal two bundle. 
And if all three are trivial, we get a Lee two group void bundle. But then we can do this augmentation trick, right? So we can augment because we have the additional map from the covers down to the base manifold, right? So from the patches, we have this map to the base manifold. And we can just introduce here an additional map. And then we get an augmented uh, two group void bundle. And this is exactly what allows us to capture these strange minus one forms, right? So, so there's indeed enough space there, but then it stops. Right, so so string theory, then it stops, you can't go any further. And this is exactly also where string theory stops because we have three legs, right? We can have zero, one, two, three in all directions, right? So, so zero is nothing, you know, uh, zero, one, two, and three, right? So this is all captured in this picture. Then there's a question about which augmented two group or to use, uh, but there's very good reasons for using, for example, TDN from candidate kind of decline reduction and scalars should take values in Narayan moduli space. And there's an embedding tensor formula that you can use then we generalize it a little bit or made it suitable for final construction. And then you can construct R fluxes, right? So there's a very natural augmented two group point. Uh, you put it in and this is what describes general, uh, well, which we conjecture to describe um, general topological, uh, general T-duality, not just the topological part for general backgrounds, right? So, so this is what should capture this whole thing. Right. And uh, importantly, if you truncate, you get back what we had before and you get geometric T-duality in particular. Again, you can make this explicit. Here, this is an example that many people will know, the T-fold for over the near manifold example, and you get everything explicit and you get exactly the, the expected case, right? So the, the things that you know, you, you can reproduce. Okay, I guess I should sum up. So what we did, uh, well, we have, a full geometric T-duality described using principle two bundles, extending the topological construction by uh, Nicolas and Waldorf. Um, we have explicit description of geometric T-duality with knee manifolds, important consistency check, everything explicit, everything down to earth. Uh, we could extend it to Q spaces. We could extend it to R spaces using these group points, two group points and augmented two group points, which are constructed in a very natural way. We reconstruct the T-duality example as a consistency check that all works. And so the upshot of this whole construction is in a sense, I'm not sure how, how of course, how general this is, that you can replace at least these non-commutative and non-associative spaces that were described, that were obtained in, from T-duality. You can resolve them in a sense in terms of this higher geometry, right? And uh, then it depends on your matter of taste. What's easier? Is it easier to deform, you know, a space to non-commutative space or is it easier to categorify in a sense, right? So. Uh, for me personally, because I've been working so much with high geometry later, this is a little bit easier, but it, it's certainly a matter of taste, right? But at least there is, in some cases, this option that non-commutative spaces can be resolved in this way. Uh, there, there, there are lots of interesting mathematical observations along the way, and uh, I, I should say that this paper was actually meant originally as a little side project, and then it exploded. And so a lot of questions haven't been answered yet. This is just the beginning of some, some, some more in-depth research of what we can do. Um, namely, we need to link many of these mathematical results of physical expectations. There is this uh, GG manifold picture. So if you remember um, um, Friedrich, uh, Friedrich's talk yesterday, he worked with NQ manifold. And as an NQ manifold uh, picture for, for DFT and generalized geometry, we need to link this much more to this. Uh, there's a question whether you can do non-abelian T-duality uh, in this picture. But what we are doing at the moment, we're trying to push this up to U-duality. That's the obvious uh, goal to get. Because then you can define something like topological U-duality and so on, all in terms of these higher bundles, right? So, so there are more or less clear generalizations, but there's a lot of work to be done. So this is just the very beginning of all of that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
all dimensions of Torah, all spatial dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I, then I would like to put the whole metric into the bundle. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's that's not a problem. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the dimension of type is just the number of TLT dimensions that you would want to have. And if it's over a point, then X is a point, that's fine. But, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Paolo, next question. Uh, yes, so um, I was a particular, I am in particular interested to your point of uh, this dual description, uh, higher geometry and uh, non-commutative uh, yeah. geometry. So. Since you have explicit examples, and, and these uh, very explicit examples of Neil manifolds can be also dealt with a uh, sister algebra yes. approach that is non commutative. Exactly, yeah. Can you see some um, dictionary going? Uh, I, I hope so. Uh, the, the, the short answer, unfortunately, is that we haven't done this work yet because I mean, it's just a uh, we started this and we are out of time because we're focusing so much on another project. But uh, this is certainly something that we plan. I mean, uh, exactly here. I mean, you should somehow see this for the, uh, the, the non commuted force vibration over the circle. Yes. Uh, right, right. So, so there should be some way of relating this. And that's certainly work that needs to be done, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we simply didn't get to it yet. Right? So, so this yes. Yes. Absolutely. I completely agree. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mentioned that uh, this non commuted space. I, I, yeah, I mean, th this needs to be studied in detail, and I can't, I didn't say more about it because I, I don't know that much about it anyway, but uh, it should, yeah, I mean, I completely agree, there should be a dictionary and this should be developed, I think that would be very, very useful. Um, I definitely agree, and uh, I have a very short question, you were very fast uh, on a slide uh, concerning the embedding tensor, can you be a little bit more Yes. Um, so because that I, I know from uh, super gravity. Yes, exactly. And, uh, right. I mean, essentially, what you want to do is you kind of want to construct the the, the generalized tangent bundle. You want to know where you zero, zero forms, one forms, two forms, and all of them live, right? And then also these R fluxes. They should also be they, they are part of this extent. There, there's an algebraic structure behind that, a uh, uh, differential graded Lie algebra that uh, encodes this whole structure right uh, this, of the generalized tangent bundle and uh, you can extend it also by the embedding tensor and these various fluxes and that tells you then uh, gives you certain representations of your groups and that tells you then exactly what spaces you would expect for i mean not for the nine modular space but for the for the augmented group point right i mean it's it's exactly here this part that is kind of non-trivial to guess right and the embedding tensor or this finite version that we did i mean the embedding tensor usually um, identifies a Lie algebra in, in your global symmetry algebra that you want to gauge, right? And you can also make this finite, and we made this finite, and then tells you what this G minus one is essentially. I can show you, it's a little bit, it's a little okay. bit more, right? Okay. What is it? I mean, that, that's, uh, that was kind of the non-trivial part. I mean, TDN is clear that it comes out by Kaluza Klein reduction, just if you directly do what you would expect. So now in modular space, okay, that's for the scalar, that's also not too hard to guess, but then this, this was a little bit non-trivial. And we have to check that this is the right guess, right? We don't know, right? So and, um, it may be wrong. Right. And the last question, please. Thanks. Yep. One comment, which may be useful, and two questions. One, the comment is that the use, use of groupoids, uh, in particular, has been used very recently in the interpretation of old Schindler's interpretation of uh, obs uh, observations in quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. which uses, which has been reinterpreted by Alberto Ibot in Carlos Tercero, mm -hmm. Beppe Marmo from Napoli, and some two others right. were also in class with Carlos Tercero. Okay? Mm -hmm. That okay. may be useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the second question is, I don't, uh, let, let me see. From what I literally know about this T duality, it comes from this kitchen metric on the, uh, on the, Fiber product you wrote down. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's an ODD Z, ODD yes. metric. Okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's an, uh, the metric has a signature DD, yeah. and there's an SOD, so D, D action yeah. on that. And one can write Hamiltonians, and this transformation is isospectral for those Hamiltonians. Mm -hmm. okay. That's all I know. Okay? Yeah. It has been used in quantum Hall effect, for example, by us, but I right. think also by others. Okay. I don't see any two forms. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last, that, last question. One, right. How do I apply this in quantum field theory? I'm not a string theorist. 
Yes. So how do I apply it in quantum field theory? Yes. Give some numbers. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, first of all, this is just exploring mathematical structures behind string theory at the moment. The ultimate hope is that we can indeed do lift this up to uh, quantum field theory, uh, very much in the sense that Daniel uh, mentioned in his talk, right, that you have some quasi isomorphism between the V-box theories, which will give you roughly a, a picture like this. So you have a theory up here, mother theory, and you have theories here and here. I mean, the examples that we know that work in this way, for example, the principal chiral model, then you have some gauge version of that, and then you have a key dual version of that. And you have these pictures. Um, thanks for your other question about the, the ODD and that, because uh, that's something that I could, couldn't mention because of time reasons. Um, the, the group that we have here, this TDN, um, the automorphism group of TDN, uh, you can define higher automorphism groups or higher groups, is exactly uh, ODD N, uh, ODDZ. Uh, it's slightly extended, right? So, so this is. Um, the, the T-duality group, of course, enters very, very nicely in this picture, and it's very important, actually, in the construction of this group. Board. So it features, um, yeah, and ultimately, we would like to, 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 to lift this up to the generalized matrix and, and make this, this connection here uh, certainly more precise. I mean, this is roughly what was in this point. Yeah. But I'd be interested in the reference also for the group board for the quantum mechanics, if you think that's important. Yeah. I'll, ask, I'll ask you later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my memory is not <laughs> Okay, so let us thank Kristen once again. Thank you. Thank you. And we move to the last speaker of the morning session and the last speaker of the after Greek night session. You put it on. All right, and we're happy that the last speaker is Jan Vesoki with the talk on Palatini action in supergravity, variation in supergravity, sorry. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. I would like first to thank the organizers for having me in this wonderful place. And compared to the previous talk, my talk will be more a simple exercise. So first of all, let me apologize for misleading every one of you by the title, because for me in this talk, supergravity will be the super simple particle case where you turn off all the fermions and you consider the easiest type two supergravity where you also turn off all the uh, Raman Raman fields. <clears throat> so for me, supergravity should be maybe called closed string effective action, where I have action given by this function, where M is just an orientable Riemannian manifold with metric G. So also for some technical reasons, I assume that G is Riemannian, but it's not really important for what I will say. Just I don't have to assume so many things if G is positive definite. This B appearing here via its exterior derivative, it's called Kalpramon field or simply B field. And again, I assume just it's a globally well defined two form, not just chirp. And phi is a scale function called the dilaton field. And first of all, I would like to explain. Uh, how this action can be viewed from a more geometrical way. And the tool to do it is generalized geometry. And why is generalized geometry? Because the pair of G and B naturally correspond to object in generalized geometry called generalized metric, which is an object living on the direct sum of T M T star M. I kind of don't like the word generalized geometry because it assume that it's something more than geometric, but it's just geometry of, of this vector bundle. And of course, there is also dilaton. So there are various options where to put the dilaton in which part of generalized geometry. So either you can consider different uh, vector bundle or encode it in some other geometrical data on this one. And this is not a new idea. So many people before me tried and to some extent succeeded in 
in geometrizing of this action, like Combra, Stripan Constable, Vodram, uh, Garcia Fernandez from Spain, and mostly the biggest inspiration for us was, of course, Paulo Chevera with Frito, and we did some work in this area. So I will now try to uh, describe the geometry which is required for this geometrical description of this action. So ingredient number one, so it's kind of simple recipe. So if you will follow this recipe, you will understand how to cook it up. So first ingredient is current algebraid. So current algebraid is just a vector bundle with some additional structures. <clears throat> and these additional structures is a vector bundle map from E to vector fields, or tangent, tangent bundle, which is called the anchor. Then on the fibers of your vector bundle, you have a metric. So you have some fiber-wise metric on E. And you have some bracket on the, on the space of section. And there are some axioms which bound all these structures together. So first of all, there is an axiom telling you if you multiply your section psi prime by a function. So it tells you what happens. And what happens is the same thing as vector field commutator does, except now you are working with sections. So you have to first map it to vector fields using this anchor map. And this is it. Then there is some kind of compatibility of the bracket with the pairing, which really resembles kind of the compatibility of the bracket and the pairing for, for Lie algebras. Then there is Jacobi identity. And then there is this fourth strange axiom, which kind of tells you that symmetric part of the bracket is not arbitrary. So the bracket is non, first of all, it's not skew symmetric. And second, its symmetric part can be somewhat controlled by the other structures, the anchor and the pairing. And if you look at first three axioms, this is exactly axioms for a Lie algebra with pairing and bracket, which are compatible together, except, uh, except for this axiom, of course. So these are quant algebraids. The simplest example of quant algebra is, of course, Dorfman bracket, where this vector bundle is dm plus t star m. This anchor row just projects the pair of one vector field and one form to the vector field. And the fiber-wise metric is canonical pairing between t and t star m. And what is interesting is the bracket, which is called Dorfman bracket, which looks like this. So if you simply calculate the commutator of the vector fields and then you construct new one form out of these objects using this formula. Uh, and you can easily check that all the axioms are almost trivially satisfied using Cartan uh, uh, relations for Cartan calculus for, for forms. The second ingredient, as I already told, is, is, is called generalized metric. So what is generalized metric in general? So I have a vector bundle with a fiberized metric, which is sometimes called quadratic vector bundle. Uh, and generalized metric, it's just a maximal positive definite subbundle of this vector bundle with respect to this fiberized metric. Uh, so it sounds a little bit strange why one would call this generalized metric. But first of all, it allows you to decompose E into direct sum of two subbundles. One, one is this V plus and one is its orthogonal complement V minus. And it turns out that this, in fact, is always a maximal negative definite subbundle with respect to this pairing. So you kind of decompose your space onto two subbundles. One is maximal positive, one is maximal definite, and this generalized metric kind of tells you which one. <clears throat> and then there is some orthogonal involution of your vector bundle, which squares to one. And these V plus minus are just these plus minus one eigenbundles. And it turns out that you can define a new fiberized metric using this formula. And this fiberized metric is always positive. So it's a kind of way to define positive definite fiberized metric on a vector bundle using with, with, with some additional properties of compatibility with this original one. And there is some group theoretical way how to say it. So uh, you can prove that there is always generalized metric and it in fact corresponds to reduction of a structure group of OPQ. This is the original structure group of your quadratic vector bundle and you can reduce it to its maximal compact subgroup OP times OQ. And again, simple example. So if your E is just TM plus T star M, 
with this canonical fiberized metric, then every generalized metric on V plus is always on this special form. So the sections of this V plus are always kind of graph of some map from TM to T star M. And if you decompose this map onto a symmetrical and skew symmetrical part, then G has to be positive definite metric on M. So therefore it's a Riemannian metric and this skew symmetric part is B is, is a two form. And if you calculate this, this fat capital G, this fiberized metric, and you write it in a block form into TM plus T star M uh, decomposition, then it looks like this. So this, this is, of course, well known from, for, for string theorists, appears, for example, in Hamiltonian of a Polyakov string. And <coughs> so, so we have now two ingredients and the kind of the, the novel one, which kind of we try to pursue is uh something which is called current algebraic connection so if i start with a current algebra by a connection on this current algebra i mean a map which takes two sections of e and gives me a new section and it satisfies kind of expected axioms which kind of resemble the ordinary affine connections so if you multiply by function in the first input you can take it out and in the second input it x using this anchor map but additionally because on every current algebra if you have this canonical metric present then you impose automatically the compatibility of this uh, of this pairing with this connection and of course we use the common notation of covariant derivative along the section using this formula uh, again one can show that connections always do exist on every current algebra. Uh, and there is a way how to see it. So you can take any vector bundle connection, so ordinary vector bundle connection compatible with the pairing. If there always exists one. And then you can use this row to construct the current algebra connections. Uh, then there are some induced structure by every connection as kind of mimics the ordinary a fine connection case. So current algebraic connections, first, both of their inputs are from gamma E, so you can construct torsion operator. And if you try to construct the naive one, which is kind of present here, you fail because the result is not, it's not a tensor, but you have to generalize and invent a new torsion and Gaultieri found that you can define a torsion free form. So it has three inputs. Here is the kind of the naive one contracted with psi double prime, but there is this additional third term. And interestingly, not only this is linear in every input, therefore it defines a tensor on your vector bundle, but it's completely skew symmetric. So this is completely skew symmetric free form, which we call torsion free form. Then for every connection, you can induce a divergence operator. This is simple. So uh, it's the same thing as you would do normally. So you just trace in two indices your Christopher symbols, let's say, and you get divergence operator. And you get a map from sections to functions, and it satisfies this condition. So if you multiply your section by function, you get this. So this is called divergence operator. And then there is, of course, you know, uh, the question of curvature tensor. This is a bit more complicated. So uh, you would first kind of try to construct this naive curvature tensor, but it has no reasonable symmetries. The first, but th that's not the biggest problem, but it's not a tensor again. So the, the linearity, if one of the inputs fails and you, you don't have tensor, therefore, you kind of think you are screwed, but unfortunately, people before us, Homan Zwiebach, invented something like this in double field theory. I mean, we mimicked their definition and we used it for current algebra, and you can define curvature tensor like this. So it looks strange, but fortunately, it's linear in every input, therefore, it defines a tensor. And what is interesting, it enjoys very nice symmetries. So, for example, you can interchange. The last two inputs get minus, first two input gets minus, and it has interchange symmetry if you in interchange two and two uh, inputs. 
And there is algebraic Bianchi, uh, Bianchi, Bianchi, Bianchi identity, uh, which tells you that if you cyclic, cyclically permute the inputs, three of the inputs, you get something which is proportional to, to this torsion free form. So there's nice algebraic Bianchi identity, identity uh, but unfortunately we still don't have any you know, nice or deeper geometrical meaning for this curvature tensor. But anyway, what is nice is due to the symmetries, you can construct a Ricci tensor uh, unambiguously. Therefore, there is only one Ricci tensor up to, up to a sign, which you can produce by taking trace of in, in the two indices of your Riemann tensor. And this Ricci tensor depends only on the connection and underlying quorum algebra. So there is no additional geometry required to construct this Ricci tensor. And then if you take any fiberwise metric on your, on your vector bundle, you can easily construct scalar curvature out of this Ricci tensor. So you can simply take the trace in the two, two inputs of the Ricci tensor and you get a scalar function. Uh, then you can ask, can I impose some nice condition on, on my connections? So of course you can say that it's torsion free if the torsion free form vanishes. You say that it's compatible with generalized metric if the covariant derivative preserves the sections of this V plus subbundle and uh, they are equivalent ways. And this is the one which most resembles the kind of metric compatibility which you would assume. And then we say, it's just, just a name, that we say that the connection is Levi Civita with respect to generalized metric V plus if it's torsion free and compatible with it. And we write that it lies in this space. Uh, but unfortunately, one can see that every two current algebraic connections are related by this free tensor here. And this free tensor is uniquely determined by the compared connection. And it's torsion free if it's completely skew symmetric part is zero. Uh, it's compatible with the generalized metric, this nabla prime, if plus minus component of this k vanishes. And uh, their divergences are the same if this kind of partial trace in the first two input inputs is zero. And this kind of shows you that probably you, because you can satisfy all these free, all these free conditions by non-trivial k, which means that there is no unique Levi-Civita connection. So there is a lot of Levi-Civita connections. So uh, it's non-empty, so you can always construct one, which is first important thing. And second one is that there's plenty of them, except for some trivial dimensions, like rank of your vector bundle is one or two, something like that. Uh, and then also what is interesting that you can choose any divergence operator and fix it. So you assume that your connection has this particular divergence operator. And then you can again show that the space of levi civita connections on EV, E with respect to V plus with this divergence operator is non-empty, but it's still infinite. So there's still plenty of choices. And uh, this is how we get back to, to our supergravity. Uh, the, and this is the description of the supergravity action using generalized geometry. So you choose E to be this TM plus T star M. You choose V plus to be generalized metric corresponding to this pair of G and B. And you, you define divergence operator using this formula. So, so you simply use the kind of divergence of, on your manifold co corresponding to this volume form, which is just the multiple of the metric one by the dilaton. And you define divergence in this way. And this is how the dilaton gets, gets into the picture. So dilaton gets, gets into the picture through the divergence of the connection. And then you assume that nabla is levitch with a connection on E with respect to V plus uh, with this particle divergent. And then the theorem is, so these are kind of setting up the geometry and the theorem is that, that this triple GBM phi satisfies the equations of motion of supergravity if and only if the scalar curvature where you take the trace using this capital G which correspond to the generalized metric is zero. And this nabla is so-called Ricci compatible with V plus, which means that our Ricci tensor is block diagonal with respect to this decomposition onto V plus and V minus. So this gives us nice kind of geometrical 
uh, description of the equations of motion of supergravity. And if you assume that your dilaton is constant on the boundary of a manifold, then you can, the action itself can be rewritten using this uh, scale curvature. Uh, and what is interesting that in this theorem, there are, as I told you, there are plenty of choices of a connection, but it doesn't depend on the particle choice of this connection. And what we did in the assumptions of the theorem that we imposed free non-trivial conditions on our, condi on our connection. So we imposed by hand that it has to be torsion free. Uh, it must be compatible with V plus and the divergence must be given by, by the diver very divergence I told you. And how we did it originally when we kind of first discovered this was that we required one and two and calculated these quantities for all possible ones. And then we kind of fiddled with such that it will give us precisely the equations of motion. And the question is, are all these requirements actually necessary to, to, to describe it? So, so is there some bigger freedom? Because we imposed these two by hand. And this is where Palatini, Palatini comes in. So this is what we call the Palatini variation. So we tried to mimic the Palatini variation from general, uh, from, from general relativity. And this is how we did it. So we start with arbitrary current. And, and, and the nice thing is that this works for any current algebraid, which is kind of important. So we start with arbitrary current algebraid. And this is kind of setting the playground. So you choose which generalized geometry you use. Uh, and we, we choose just these fields. So we choose generalized metric, which in turn defines some fiberwise metric. Then we choose arbitrary current algebra connections. So we don't impose anything on this connection at all. So we just simply choose the most general one. And we fix an arbitrary volume form on our manifold. And you can take these three pieces of data and construct an action. So you simply use this G, which is now unrelated to NABLA, and take the trace of the Ricci tensor to construct the scale of function. And you integrate this scale function over omega and integrate everything and integrate over m. And this is called, we call this Palatini action. And then you look at the equations of motion of this action. So this is kind of easy, easy exercise. So first you can vary the volume form. Uh, that's easy. You just multiply this by e to epsilon lambda, where lambda is some function vanishing on boundary, and you find precisely the term proportional to lambda times omega, which implies immediately that this scalar function has to be zero. So you get the first equations of motion. Equation of motion is that the scalar curvature vanishes. This explains nicely why the supergravity equation of motion for the dilaton is precisely this one, because variation of volume form is the same thing as variation of the dilaton. Then you can vary the generalized metric. Here you have to be a bit careful. So you start with a generalized metric and you observe that every other generalized metric can be written as a graph of a map from V plus to V minus. Uh, v prime minus is in fact already given by the map, which is uniquely determined by phi plus. And then this gives you an idea how to vary the generalized metric. So you choose arbitrary vector bundle map from V plus to V minus. You assume that it vanishes on the boundary, and you define V prime plus epsilon to be graph of this map, epsilon this phi plus map. And if you assume that epsilon is small and uh, is defined, if, if everything is compact, that's easy. It always defines generalized metric. If not, you have to assume that this support of this phi plus is compact, and then epsilon can be always chosen small enough such that this is again generalized metric. And you calculate what happens to this fiberized metric you use to take, this, take the trace. And you can simply calculate it. It's easy. And then you plug it inside, and you, you, you see that uh, the, the action changes in this way. And if you look at this carefully, this gives you precisely that this Ricci tensor has to be blocked down. Plus minus component of your Ricci tensor has to vanish. So this is the second equation of motion which explains why the supergravity equations for G and B correspond precisely to this Ricci compatibility condition. So this kind of explains how this in, on Earth can, can, can describe, you know, uh, 
the supergravity equations of motion. And then what is most interesting thing, we varied the Palatini, uh, we, we varied the connection, which is kind of hard of, of, of the Palatini trick. So, <clears throat> so you can vary it very easily like this. So you can define new connection number prime and you simply add here some arbitrary free tensor which has this kind of schematic in the last two inputs. This is, and then this is the most general, you know, variation of a current algebraic connection. And you assume that it vanishes on the boundary. Uh, yes, this is the same divergence operator I have told you before. So the, this divergence operator is the same one using the volume form. Uh, equivalently, it satisfies this kind of nice integral equation. So, so if you integrate divergence of something times omega, it gives you boundary term. And we fix a connection from this class, connection compatible with V plus and with this particle divergence. And then in fact, you can describe it, every con your starting connection with number zero and sometimes a K. And in fact, this means that we change just this tensor K to some K prime epsilon, which is K plus epsilon L. And then you just plug it inside and you calculate what happens. And a nice, nice thing is that we were able to get rid of all derivatives of this L, which was kind of scary if it will kind of be possible, but it was. And it turns out that this term here is proportional to L. Therefore, this, this, this free tensor, which is Q-symmetric in the last two inputs, has to vanish. And this tensor depends only on K and V plus. So, the, the conclusion is that this connection nabla is extremal of, of, of our palatine action if and only if this tensor vanishes. So then you have to look on this tensor and interpret what its vanishing means. Uh, and first basically thing is that the partial traces of this tensor K must vanish, which implies immediately that the divergence of the connection nabla is the same as the divergence of the connection nabla zero. This this one starting here. So the divergence of our connection, which has to extremize the, the, uh, the action has to satisfy this, this formula. And then you look at various components of this tensor. So plus plus minus and minus plus minus components of this tensor gives you that nabla is in fact compatible with V plus and plus 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 and minus minus components of this tensor gives you that the skew symmetric, completely skew symmetric power of K vanishes, which is the equivalent of saying that Nabla is a torsion free connection. So kind of the final answer, what, what this vanishing means that this, this tensor vanishes if and only if our first arbitrary condition, uh, connection of plant algebra is levi with respect to V plus with this particle easy divergence. So this is kind of the, Theorem summarizing it. So we start with any current algebra. It. We start with these three pieces of data. And uh, divergence operator is this one using just the volume form. And then V plus nabla omega, omega, extremalize the Palatini action if and only if. So these are the first two equations of motion. And this is the third one saying that our connection nabla has to be levicivita with respect to V plus satisfying this divergence condition. So this kind of confirmed that our by hand assumption about connection was right. And uh, what, is, what is important, very important is that the first two equations of motion do not depend on particle solution of this equation. So you can choose any nabla from this class and these two equations do not depend on it. Uh, so one can get rid of uh, the connection. You can simply say you integrate out, or you just plug one particle solution into your action. And what is nice kind of interpretation of this, which is kind of very vague, so don't be mad at me, that one can think of Nabla as some gauge field of this section, and this divergence is a corresponding field strength of this, of this field. And what is important then, then, as I told you, you can get rid of connection and get an Einstein-Hilbert action out of this picture. So you now assume that this nabla is one of the solutions 
uh, of your equation. So it's Levi-Civita has this particle divergent and it's fixed, but it can be otherwise arbitrary. And then the remaining equations of motion remain the same, uh, in particle these two equations of motion. So this, again, nicely explains why these two equations are precisely the equations of motion. And how you get the original supergravity action out of this? So you choose Tm plus T star M. Uh, you assume that M is connected for simplicity. Therefore, uh, any volume form can be written as a multiple of the metric volume form corresponding to this G, which is hidden in the generalized metric. And this is how Dilaton gets back into the play. Uh, this G here plays an auxiliary role. It's not important that it comes from this one. So you can choose, in principle, G coming from any other, any other G, but why not this one? Uh, and the a priori assumption we made is just, just, just plugging this equation of motion into the Palatine action. And then you can calculate everything and you really end up with the, uh, with the supergravity action. So this, for this particle ge geometrical setting, this Einstein-Hilbert action is the supergravity action I started with. If you write everything using G, B, and phi. Whoops. This is some ninja move, which always does this. I don't know what it is. Uh, OK. And so what are the benefits of this description? So you can ask, OK, so what? <laughs> so you proved that your theorem was working and, and what? And the, the good thing is that you can choose any current algebra right, to do these things. So for example, if you choose Tm plus T star M plus additional, additional guy here, where GP is agent bundle of some principle G bundle of RAM, uh, where G is compact Lie group, you obtain something which is called heterotic supergravity. So simply plug in and use some convenient parameterization of generalized metric, and this gives you heterotic supergravity. Uh, one can also play with some, some nice things. So we can always calculate explicitly this scalar curvature and this Richardson's also for any quasi lie algebra. So there's some particle class of current algebra leads to something which is called Lie quasi Lie algebra. Uh, this allows one to find theories which are immediately by design equivalent to this original supergravity. So for example, if your B is invertible, so you can write its inverse as some theta, some bivector theta, then it's known that this uh, bivector theta is in fact db twisted Poisson structure on your manifold. So if you have seen the talks when there was h twisted uh, h twisted uh, Poisson manifolds, this is exactly example for h being db, and you can then simply work out everything explicitly for 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 different description of a generalized metric, and you obtain something which is called symplectic gravity. It's by in the work by Blumenhagen. Uh, and what is also interesting, which is kind of, we didn't write everything properly, but for example, you can choose fixed Poisson tensor, and then you can describe your generalized metric in terms of other fields, capital G and capital Phi, which are related by these equations. And this is called Zyberg with an open closed relations. So this is a kind of, way to choosing different backgrounds and different best description using the same generalized metric. And then you can find an effective action, which is completely equivalent to the original one, but it uses this capital G and capital Phi and Phi. So it's kind of nice toys you can play with. And what we are now trying to do uh, is to do generalized Palatini action, uh, which would also give us something which is called generalized supergravity by, by Zaitlin, but unfortunately, I wrote this two days ago, and yesterday I found out that this, this is probably nonsense, but I kept it there. So maybe we'll find it somehow someday. And that's it. Thank you very Thank much. You. So it's time for questions, comments, remarks, please. And then. 
thank you for bringing this. Uh, so what about high derivative corrections? Because you no, I no idea, no idea. But the the first order formalism. I mean, it's, it's sensitive to these things. Yeah, I have no idea how to generalize this for. And of course, there will probably the next question would be: Can we do it for the full supergravity, like not just this toy one, right? So, so there is a way how to add Ramon Ramon field in the picture. Uh, okay. Frito knows how to do it. Paolo Chevera has to do it. Has to do it. So this can be probably generalized to have Ramon Ramon field. But of course, there is a question of adding fermions into the picture, and to that I have no answer. So this nice geometrical description only works for bosonic part of supergravity, and always did just for bosonic part. Hopefully, there will be a way how to invent some right geometry or super geometrical analog of all this, which should be possible because already we know how to do super current algebra. So there are chances that they, this will be possible to do for 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 uh, non-commuting fields as well but who knows next question please hi uh, could you please go back to the, uh, the well, first slides where you have introduced the distortion tree form yes of I, I have a curiosity it's not just it's not a question it's yeah, here, here. When here. you discuss the no the, the, the slide up the following. Yeah, this one. Curvature. Yeah, when you discuss the curvature. Um first of all, the curvature is uh, to form or is, does it change? Because no, the curvature is usually free. The curvature operator has to imp the remontance has always you know four indices. Yeah, and so but my it, and since you have a torsion three form, which then usually it is a one four. No, torsion is two one tensor. And if you have a metric, you can make it into okay, three zero. What, okay. And of, of if you you have some you have some uh, you have this canonical metric uh, because you are working with current algebra, so you can always uh, you know raise and lower indices as you want. So, okay. Just the overall number of inputs is important, not where, whether okay. they are one forms or, or sections. And here at, at this moment, your, uh, your connection, is it torsion free or not? No. It's not torsion free. No. So my question is, why have you chosen the last symmetry of the Riemann tensor? Because- This one? Yeah, yeah. that's funny thing. That's funny thing. You are Good observation. Okay. Yes, of course, for ordinary Riemann tensor, yes. this symmetry only works for torsion reconnections. Yes. Uh, I think they have to be at least maybe also metric compatible. I'm not sure. But yes, you have to, because you have to use Bianchi identity to get this, get yeah. this symmetry. And here, not. Here is this symmetry is the easiest of them all because it's manifest. <laughs> this is strange because if you look at this definition, you can. Okay. easily find that this is just the combination of one of these two and some manifest if you look at this definition it's manifestly mani manifestly manifestly uh, symmetric if you just put all the inputs the other way around so if you put psi prime psi phi phi prime you will get the same thing because this is exactly symmetric in this interchange and this also so there is kind of stupid manifest symmetry of this tensor which okay. you can then combine with one of these to get this one and of course, this is not true for for usually when ordinary you're... geometry. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. You're so, right. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Next question, please. Hey, it's more a comment to the the last question about the, uh, the higher derivative corrections, and this is actually what people are working on on the higher derivative corrections, and they can write them in ODD covariant ways. So. There are some subtleties, so at the moment it just works for the leading corrections in bosonic and heterotic string, but this this can be done just, just because you ask. Okay. Just wanted to know if you have already explicit formulas with uh, cyber width and open closed, uh, or you just uh, say uh, that it's possible. It's it's possible. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because the, the, the explicit formulas will be probably too ugly to be useful to do anything. That's the problem that 
it's not easy. Like it, they are complicated, and I I don't think they will be nice anyway. But you can work them out if you want. But it's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I will abuse my privilege as a chair. Is what happens in low dimensions? So if you take a dimension, because this is for a manifold of any dimension, right? Yes. So yes, what happens in low dimensions? Say one it, or two. It, well, I say two. Uh, two, two, two are fine because then the rank of our current algebra is four, and everything works. What is what only fails is if m is one dimensional, I yeah. guess, uh, because then the Levi-Civita connection is uniquely determined. Uh, actually, I've never checked that. What happens? Definitely, you don't have a B field, right? Because you have one-dimensional manifold. You don't have metric. It's just a scale function. Yeah. No, everywhere. Actually, I never checked, but probably it will give nothing interesting. Okay. I don't know. Okay. So let's thank the speaker once again. And thanks all the speakers of today's session and the audience after the Greek nights. And we conclude the session for the morning and for today. Enjoy the rest.